Hello and welcome to the Tactics Green Room Series Tax Prep Workshop. Uh, my name is Heather Marie Connors and here with me today is my partner Al Connors. Woo -woo -woo. <laughs> uh, we are your webinar facilitators uh, for today. Hello, how are you? How's your pandemic? How's everybody doing? Uh, it's tax season. Can you feel it? I can certainly feel it. Uh, happy World Theater Day, which is also today. Um, before I tell you a little bit more about myself, I just wanted to draw your attention to, uh, there's a link in the chat for a little survey. Um, this is for me to learn a little bit more about you and where you're coming from um, when it comes to your self-employed tax needs. So if you could just quickly uh, click that link and answer the questions, um, that would be fantastic. Uh, as I said, my name is Heather Marie, and uh, just to give you a bit of my background, um, I have an arts admin background, so I spent many years uh, as a manager in the nonprofit arts sector, and that is where I developed uh, my passion, let's say, for all things uh, financial management related. And a few years ago, I uh, started my own uh, bookkeeping business. It's called Lower Town Bookkeeping. And through that business, I uh, work still with lots of uh, nonprofit arts organizations, charities. I also work with uh, sole proprietors 
on uh, things like book, all things bookkeeping, including uh, GST returns and personal tax returns. So if you ever uh, want to know more about the services that I offer or you need any of my help, uh, my email address is there and there's my little plug uh, for myself. <laughs> um, so how are we doing on the survey? Do we have any responses as of yet there, Al? Uh, let's take a look. No. Cool. Okay. So we'll start with a little bit uh, of a disclaimer for um, the information that uh, you're going to get um, from this webinar. Uh, Every effort has been made, obviously, to make sure that I'm presenting you with accurate information. But this information today is very general. Um, tax prep is a very large uh, subject and we're only going to deal with a very small part of it today so uh, the information I'm giving you like I said is going to be pretty general and it's not meant to replace any specific professional advice that you may have already received or that you will receive in the future um, every tax situation is uh, different and really needs to be looked at uh, as a whole um, so just so you're aware of that as we move through. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, uh, like I said, we're going to keep it um, pretty brief and pretty general, and we're going to deal with a very specific part of the personal tax return, which is self-employment income and self-employment taxes. So we're going to go through uh, some different types of of income that you might receive as a self-employed person and then the different types of deductions that you would take from that income so your eligible expenses that reduce your taxable income and then of course we are going to touch on some of the the COVID related measures because a lot of people are wondering about that reporting that on their tax returns and uh of course, some administration stuff will tell you the deadlines, talk about record keeping, and any uh, comments, questions. So throughout, if you do have questions, you can throw them in the chat, and Al's going to shout them out to me um, if you want more information about a, a particular section. If we don't get to your question or if after the webinar you want to follow up on something, feel free to send me an email and I'm happy to answer questions in more detail that way. Speaking of questions, do we have any uh, survey results here that I can look at? No. Okay, cool. That's fine. It's not a problem. We'll just move right along. Okay, so. Let's talk about income. We all already know that uh, when you have a job, you report your employment income on a tax return. Employment income is taxed at source, meaning that if you are an employee, taxes are taken off of each paycheck that you receive. And at the end of the year, you're issued a, you are issued a T4 with your employment income and deduction amounts. As a self-employed person, it's not that straightforward. You maybe have received throughout the year uh, T4As for different types of work that you did. Um, perhaps you issued invoices throughout the year for services that you provided. And as an artist, maybe you received grant money uh, for a project that you did or for your company. These are all examples of self-employment income and self-employment income is not taxed at source, but it is taxable and must be reported on your personal tax return. So most income that you receive throughout the year is in this taxable category. There are some amounts of money that uh, are not taxed, and that would be things like lottery winnings, uh, gifts uh, and inheritances are not taxable and um, amounts at TFSA or tax-free savings account amounts um, are also not taxable. 
Uh, so in addition to income amounts being taxable, income replacement programs are also taxable. So that would be your CERB, your CRB, and your, your EI, those kinds of things. Um, so in general, any support that's intended to replace or mimic taxable income, uh, you have to report on the return. So speaking of the return, this little area in step two of your personal tax return, this is basically where we're going to live today. This is the area of the tax return that we are dealing with. So just to give you a little more of a close up there. Uh, it's just a few lines and yet it contains our whole lives, at least for uh, tax purposes. So you can see uh, there is an other income line. There's an other income line that is specifically for artist project grants. And then there is the self-employment income section, uh, which has your business and professional income, the gross and net amounts. So those amounts are calculated using a form called the T2125, which we're going to get to, and the results go here on step two, and this is the basis of uh, what we are dealing with today. Okay, so maybe you think of what you do as a business, and maybe you don't. For tax purposes, generally speaking, uh, self-employment income is business income. OK, so a business, technically speaking, according to the CRA, is an activity that you intend to carry on for profit. So it doesn't actually matter if you are making any money, but if you intend to make money at something, uh, then you are conducting a business and there is evidence to support that intention. So business income obviously includes income from any activity you do for profit. For example, income from a theater company you run is business income. It's really important, and I know that you know this, but it's worth saying out loud. It's really important to include all of your income from all of the different sources when you are calculating it for tax purposes. If there is proof out there of uh, revenue that you have received that you do not report uh, and the CRA discovers it, uh, you may be subject to some pretty hefty penalties. So there's your warning there. Uh, one update. Yeah. Uh, so uh, people couldn't see the link that I was posting for some reason. It has since been posted and some responses are coming in. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Cool. All right. So should I check it now or maybe I should leave it for a minute? Uh, sure, the responses are uh, updating right now. You can check it now. Okay. So let's just see. So I'm just curious. Okay. So most people have a mix of employment and self-employment income. Uh, for some reason, I can't scroll down here. Uh, try the other direction. Oh. There we go. <laughs> okay, and GST, most people are not GST, HST registered. And we mostly have uh, people who work predominantly in the performing arts. Okay, that's basically uh, what I was expecting. So that is cool. Thank you very much for that information. Okay, so we'll just go back to talking about income. And as I was saying, it, it is important to, to track your gross business income. And the CRA requires you to keep records of all of this income. Um, original documents, and those include things like contracts, uh, invoices, receipts, basically anything that proves that a transaction took place. Uh, you need to keep that. One, you need to keep it in case the CRA asks to see it, but two, you obviously need it when you're compiling the information for your tax return. Okay, the T2125. This is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time because I'm going to take you through um, how to complete the T2125. So as I was saying earlier, maybe you think of what you do as running a business and maybe you don't. This is the framework 
that the CRA sees it. So this is the form where you're going to enter all of your income and all of your expenses as a self-employed individual and the results of which are going to go back into that step two of your personal um, tax return. Okay. So the first thing you're going to notice when you're reading the instructions of how to complete the T2125 is that it'll tell you if you have both business and professional income, you have to complete a separate form for each. And that can be confusing because you might question right away, well, you know, do I have business income or do I have professional income? Which category do I fit in? So I'm here to tell you, uh, don't sweat this question too much. For most of you, and again, because I know that most of you are, are uh, working in the performing arts, most of you are going to fit into that business income uh, section. The professional income part of it is useful more for, say, uh, visual artists who have things like um, they're, they're commissioned uh, they have commission income and works in progress that they need to claim over a period of time. That's where it's more advantageous to go the professional income route. But for most things, really, uh, these two types of income are treated very much the same. So, uh, yeah, so don't sweat that, that question. Uh, also, the whole thing of whether or not you are running more than one business. Um, the reason the CRA is very specific about this is really for cases where uh, there is, say, uh, large dispositions of property, capital gains, um, or there's income from businesses in different provinces. You know, all uh, kind of larger situations than likely what you are dealing with. So even though as a self-employed artist, it's very likely that you wear many hats and it may, um, you know, for example, perhaps you run a theater company and you also uh, teach drama. Okay, so in one sense, those might seem like separate businesses, but they have a lot of things in common. So, for example, they probably have one uh, base of operations. They have, there's a lot of similarities in the characteristics of what you're doing. All of this to say, if you keep s separate records for your different businesses and you prefer to report it that way, go ahead. But otherwise, I would say don't sweat this. Consider yourself one business and all of your activities part of that business and just fill out one T2125. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so the first thing in the identification that I just wanted to touch on was the idea of an industry code. So you're supposed to enter the industry code that best describes your activity. These codes, if you're curious, it's, it's called the North America Industry Classification System. And if you want to find out what code applies to your business activity, you can go to the StatsCan website and there's actually a, a search engine and you can look through the different industries and find your uh, specific code. Um, again, it's likely that the codes I've listed here, one of these will apply to you. Theater, musical theater, independent artist, independent actor. Uh, so you feel free to note the one that applies to your business. If you are filing electronically and you're using a tax prep software, uh, you have to go with the industry codes that are available within the software. So it's some some of them will like ask uh, questions about the type of business that you run, and that it'll uh, it will input that code for you. But just so you know uh, what that is. Another thing I wanted to flag in the T2125 is this idea of uh, internet business activities. And that is to say that if you are earning income from a website, the CRA wants to know about it. So that would include uh, selling goods or services through a website, whether or not you have your own um, payment 
processing within the site. So even if on your site you have a form that people fill out uh, requesting a good or a service, that would still be considered uh, income from a website. And on the form, you have to identify this website information and the amount of income that you're earning through it. And when I say this, I can immediately feel the question coming, you know, does uh, do things like uh, like crowdfunding sites count? Do you have to put it in this uh, section of the, of the form? And uh, I'm going to go with no on that one, because the intention here really is the CRA wants to know from the sites that you own or manage, uh, where you're directly selling uh, goods and services, that's what they want on this part of the form. However, if you are doing some form of crowdfunding where you're asking people to give you money uh, be to produce something, that is considered earning income and you do have to report that on your tax return. So it, Patreon, I think, is an example of, of that site. Right. So the only time that the income is not taxable is if it is a gift from one person to another. As soon as you attach an expectation to the gift, so an example of that expectation would be there's going to be a piece of art that is created down the road. That is a business activity and that is business income. Hopefully that answers that question. Okay, so whether you're com you are completing the the business income section or professional income section you uh, start by entering your uh, gross amount of income including your gst hst and then you adjust for the gst hst amounts uh, now if i'm remembering from those survey results most people here are not gst hst registered would that be accurate al correct okay so then we're not going to go too much into the, the complexities other than to say that once you are GST registered, there are some complexities here. Um, you do want to make sure that you complete your GST return before you complete your tax return because you'll need some amounts from that return from that return to enter onto this return. Um, and just to talk a little bit more about GST, because sometimes people wonder if they should be charging it or they should register for a GST number. Um, I'll tell you the CRA requirement. So if you're providing goods or services in the course of your business activity, what you were providing are called taxable supplies. Every person who makes a taxable supply has to register for a GST number unless they are cons what is considered a small supplier. So a small supplier would be someone whose taxable supplies from all business activities is less than $30,000 per year. Once you reach that $30,000 per year threshold, and again, it's from all activities, all self-employment income, you are required to register for that GST number. And as a sole proprietor, you are issued one GST number. It is attached to you, the person. Um, there may be advantages for you to register before you reach that $30,000 threshold. Uh, in most cases, no, because like I say, it does add complications to uh, your rec record keeping needs and uh, it adds another tax return that you need to do. Um, but maybe there are contracts that you want to go after that are only available to people who are GST, HST registered, or maybe you know that you're going to reach that threshold and you want to get ready for it administratively. You want to put the, the processes in place uh, and just rip that bandaid off in terms of getting the number and learning how to complete the, the tax return. So that is to say that you don't have to wait until you hit that 30,000. Uh, it just depends on your, your situation and your appetite for, for that threshold of income. Okay, so 
back to the T2125. There is an area uh, for other income. Uh, line 8230 of the form is where you can enter grant money that you've received from a government, government agency, or non-government agency. In this form uh, on that line, remember that it is the gross amount that you receive that you put in, and then the expenses related to that grant income will uh, be included later. So now's the fun part where we're going to calculate our net income by deducting our eligible expenses. This is this is a big one because um, it's the area of the T2125 I probably get asked about the most. People often wonder uh, what expenses can I claim and on what line, you know, what uh, category do my expenses fit into? So the form has a pretty extensive list uh, of different types of supplies, but the CRA also allows you to add any other expenses that don't necessarily fit into those categories in recognition of the fact that every business has a different set of expenses. So I am going to go through some of these expenses in a little bit more detail, but to speak uh, generally to it, um, if it is an expense that is connected to earning income, either the pursuit of income or the earning of the income, <laughs> um, that is an eligible business expense. So you have to think about uh, what is reasonable and how it connects to income that you have earned. And if you can prove both that it is reasonable and that it is connected to earning income, then it fits. Was there a question about that? Yes. Uh, Chelsea asks, do you add the grant amount if some of it was not used as income and you used it to pay someone else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, the entire grant uh, is income for you. All of the expenses related to the project that you did uh, with that grant are eligible expenses that reduce the amount of that taxable income. So the part that you're actually going to pay taxes on would be the part that you retained um, for yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, and one more, uh, which I think is related. Uh, what if it's income donated from a foundation, but that was directed at a certain project you're doing? So. Yeah, so that, that would be the, the same thing, is that you, um, you report the income, but you also report all of the related expenses. Um, in most cases, uh, these projects have pretty tight margins and pretty tight budgets. So the tax implications for the individual are not going to be huge because you've probably spent most of the money that you brought in, right? The, the key to it is to keep all of the supporting documentation, right? So um, when you're paying people, you want to have some kind of records in place. You want to have a contract or you want to have them invoice you or you at least want to generate receipts that show that you have paid this person to do this thing. Uh, because if you are the one who is receiving the, uh, the income, then you are the one that has to report it and all of the related expenses. Uh, oh, yes. So I just wanted to mention this first part uh, of the expense section of the T2125, the cost of goods sold section, um, just in case there's any uh, confusion here. This part is for if you sell goods. So uh, you have to know your opening and closing inventory and then the expenses related directly to selling those goods, uh, which is called the cost of goods sold. Uh, in most cases, if you don't uh, maintain an inventory of anything, you don't need to worry about this section 
you're going to put all of your expenses in the next section, which is part four. Okay, so here is uh, some of that list again. Some of these are obvious and some of them are less so. So like advertising, you would know what an advertising expense is. Uh, meals and entertainment, most people know that the maximum you can claim there is uh, 50%. Insurance, uh, this is for commercial insurance related to your business. If you have a building or you have insurance on any of the uh, equipment that you use. Interest and bank charges, this refers specifically to interest on borrowed money or fees related to a loan. Uh, of course, any uh, licenses, memberships, annual fees, dues, those are all uh, totally legit business expenses that you're going to put on, on that line. Also on that line, you can include uh, subscriptions to publications that relate to your profession. So keep that in mind. This is a fun one. Okay, so there's a line for office expenses and a line for office, office supplies, pardon me. What is the difference? Great question. Okay, so according to the CRA, an office expense is small items like pens, paper clips, stationery, stamps. Office supplies is a more general term that they use for any supplies related to the business that you do. So obviously every business needs different types of supplies. This is kind of the catch-all line for those supplies. Every office office looks different. Every business has different supplies. Uh, professional fees. So that would be uh, if you have received any external professional advice, including bookkeeping services, tax prep services, uh, any types of uh, consulting fees, um, you can claim those as a business expense. The management and admin fee line, this is where you put your, your regular bank charges related to your, your business banking. And then um, if you do have any, if you are an employer, if you do have any employees, uh, you can of course claim salaries, wages, benefits, uh, and the, uh, including the employer's contribution, um, that whole expense of having employees you can claim. Um, travel expenses. This might be one that some people forget about, but if you have to go anywhere, I mean, none of us are going anywhere these days, but if you did have to go somewhere to earn income, the cost of you getting from point A to point B is a business expense, including if you take transit. Uh, you can also claim some uh, motor vehicle expenses if you own a car and you use that car uh, in, to earn income. The trick with the motor vehicle expenses is you have to be really good with your record keeping. So you're going to want to keep a log book and every time you're driving your car and it's related to business, you want to note your kilometers, beginning and ending kilometers, so that you know exactly at the end of the year how much you have traveled uh, in the course of business. So deductible expenses related to your car can include things like license and registration fees, uh, fuel costs, insurance, um, interest costs on the money borrowed to buy the vehicle, maintenance and repairs, and uh, leasing costs. If you use your vehicle occasionally for business purposes, um, you can claim these motor vehicle expenses on a per trip basis. If you use your vehicle for business and personal, you can claim part of the total operating expenses um, as a business expense. Again, you have to keep accurate records uh, that show the part of the total kilometers that you drove for your business. And there is a, a, a worksheet um, that helps you figure out the, the deductible amount based on how much you drove in the year, how much you drove for business purposes, and then the percentage of all of your expenses. Okay, capital cost allowance. So this is another question that I get a lot, which is, what is a capital cost? A capital cost would be anything that is a, a kind of a larger investment in your business. It's um, 
a piece of property like a building or a vehicle um, that is uh, something that's going to have value over time. Um, when you make those big purchases, uh, you might be able to claim uh, what is called a capital cost allowance on them. If you buy items like the, the really common ones are a new computer or a cell phone, uh, and you buy that for your business, you are not supposed to claim the entire cost of that item in the year that you purchase it. Uh, instead, you deduct a percentage of that item's cost over a period of years. Um, the part that you're claiming is called the depreciation amount. Um, and the term capital cost allowance is, is used for income tax purposes. Uh, CCA claims are a little bit complicated. Uh, you will see the, the uh, calculation for it is included in the T2125. We're not gonna get too much into it here. Uh, most tax software is gonna walk you through this process. Uh, and on the CRA website, you can find a list of the commonly used uh, CCA classes with their descriptions um, and uh, the rates, the depreciation rates. So this is mostly to say you should be aware that uh, when you are making larger purpose purchases, that um, it's not necessarily 100% of business expense in, uh, in the year that you buy it. Okay, Ooh, another fun one is business use of home expenses. Okay, so this is not to be confused with employment expenses related to working from home. Because you, you may have heard about this uh, in the news or, or, or from the CRA. There are uh, new calculation methods introduced for 2020 because of the uh, COVID-related requirements that employees work from home. So uh, as a matter of course, employees can uh they can claim expenses related to working from home if their employer requires them to work from home. And it's usually a bit of a complex process. The forms are a bit onerous. And so when COVID hit and a lot of people had to work from home because of COVID, not because their employer necessarily uh, was requiring it, there was pressure put on the CRA to simplify the process so that employees could more easily claim the expenses related to working from home. So they introduced a temporary flat rate method for 2020 um, that is uh, $2 a day for every day you had to work from home to a maximum of $400 without any uh, employer certification. So your employer doesn't have to uh, fill out any forms for you to make that claim. And then they, they simplified some of the regular uh, require, form requirements for employees to, to claim deductions who had you know more than the, the $2 a day would, would cover. So this doesn't apply to self-employed income. The way that you claim your business use of home expenses as a self-employed person has not changed for 2020. Uh, but uh, I did see in the survey that a lot of people have a mix of employment and self-employment income. So if you do have an employer and you were required to work from home in 2020, you may be eligible to make this claim. Um, and hopefully you've already had the conversation with your employer as to whether you would need a, a, a simplified or detailed method. Um, uh, but so that's just a flag that that exists and that there are it's separate, the employer uh, requirements and the self-employed. So we're going to talk about the self-employed business use of home. So this is where you can deduct expenses for the business use of a workspace in your home as long as you meet one of the following conditions. OK, it needs to be your principal place of business 
or the space that you only use to earn income and meet with your meet with your clients and customers. You can deduct part of the, your home costs, uh, such as heating, home insurance, electricity, and even your cleaning supplies. So basically what you have to do is uh, calculate the area of your workspace divided by the total area of your home, and that gives you the ratio to apply uh, to those expenses. It gives you the percentage of those expenses that you can claim. Um, so, and this, this can get a, a little complicated too. You, you wanna keep it reasonable. And technically speaking, uh, well, let's just say it has to be real. <laughs> if the CRA asks to see this workspace, it better exist, right? And if it is a part of your home that, is, that you use for business and for personal, then they want you to do a more complicated calculation where you, you take into consideration how many hours it's used as a, a business space and how many hours it's, and, and divide that by 24 hours, right? Which would be the, the, the rest of the total for personal use. Um, and then base your calculations on that. So just to be aware of all of those requirements for business use of home. Uh, and then we get into um, other income. So, okay, so that the business use of home, that's the end of our T2125 form. Now we're going back to uh, step two of the tax return where I mentioned uh, other income. So this is the catch-all, obviously, for anything that doesn't fit anywhere else, uh, but is still income that you are required to report. There is a line here uh, specifically for the scholarships, bursaries, and artist project grants. So yes, uh, I'm sure you have noticed there are two places where you can report artist project grants. Um, both of them are legitimate. I would say the way I would approach it is if you received a grant that is mostly to uh, to cover your living expenses um, while you create. I would probably just use this other income line for a grant like that. But if you receive a grant like for a project that has expenses, I would include that uh, with your business income and expenses on the T2125. Um, so you, you have a couple options there. All right, so are we okay? Do, is there anything we need to cover from any of that? Uh, there's a question about international customers and the need for a BAT number. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, just saying that it's probably a better email question. <laughs> yeah, it's a little beyond the, the scope of today's uh, workshop, unfortunately. Okay, so let's talk about these COVID-19 income supports. So again, we're on that step two uh, of our tax return and that line, uh, other income, is where these income support programs are going to go. So that includes the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, the Canada Emergency Student Benefit, uh, and the, the Canada Recovery Benefit. All of these uh, income replacement programs are taxable. And this other income area is where uh, they need to be reported. So um, you should receive slips for any of these uh, support payments that you did receive. So you have the amounts, you know what you need to report. For the CERB, uh, that was the $500 a week benefit for those who stopped working due to COVID available for a maximum of 28 weeks. No tax was withheld on the CERB payments. Um, so guess what? Your tax bill is now coming due on those amounts. Um, you should receive from the CRA or should have already received uh, either a T4A or a T4E that reports those amounts. The CESB, that was uh, between 1250 and 2000 per four weeks 
for up to four periods for students who are unable to work due to COVID-19. Again, no tax was withheld on these payments. And again, uh, you should receive a, a T4A uh, with that amount. The CRB uh, is what replaced the CERB. So that was $500 a week for up to 26 weeks for those who are who were not eligible for EI, but who had reduced earnings due to COVID-19. Now for this program, income tax was withheld on these payments, I believe uh, at a rate of 10%. The amount that you received will uh, appear on a T4A. Um, and it is worth noting that there is a clawback on the CRB, which it means that if your net income for the year ended up exceeding $38,000, the government is going to ask you to repay some of the CRB that you received. Uh, the repayment is uh, 50 cents of the benefit for each dollar above that $38,000. So just something to be aware of there. Okay, so those that's basically those uh, three lines that we looked at back in the, the step two of, of the personal uh, tax return. We've now gone through completing the, the T2125, and we've talked about the amounts that go into other income. So now as more of a, a note on administration, let's talk about bookkeeping. So the truth is, if you are self-employed, if you are running a business, whether or not you think of it that way, um, it requires some form of bookkeeping and the complexity of that bookkeeping really depends on your situation. Uh, you are required by law to keep records of all your transactions and be able to support your income and expense claims. So again, that's sort of the test you can do when you are wondering yourself, um, is this business income? Is this a business expense? What is the paper trail? What can I support? And if I had to justify it, how would I justify it? Um, the type of records that you keep, there's no uh, re specific requirement by the CRA. So you could use a bookkeeping software if that works for you. Or you can just use a book with a list of revenues and expenses. Just make sure that you keep all your receipts, your stubs, your contracts, your statements, etc. Obviously, the benefits of keeping complete and organized records uh, include the fact that, again, as an artist, it's likely that you're wearing a lot of hats and you may have income from many different sources. The better you are at record keeping, the easier the process is going to be, A, to track down the money that is owed to you, right? You need to be on top of that. B, it's going to make um, tax time a whole lot easier. And C, if you do have income that is not taxable, if your records are in shape and you have all of your support documents, you'll be able to prove to the CRA, look, this is not business income, this is not taxable income. So it's a good idea to decide whether this is something that uh, you can handle yourself or whether it's something you want to farm out to, to someone like me. Um, it's where a bookkeeper or an accountant uh, or a financial planner can really help you is in making sure that you are uh, staying, keeping good records. Uh, one question about the CERB clawback. Yeah. Uh, and that's on uh, $38,000. Is it a, a net taxable income or yes. gross income? Net taxable income. The clawback on the, on the CRB is net taxable income. Yeah. Okay, so there hasn't been a change to the, the filing deadline for, for 2021. Um, so just as a reminder, the filing date for self-employed individuals is June 15th. However, if you do owe any tax, you are going to want to pay that tax by the end of April to avoid uh, any penalties. So it's a good idea every year um, even though you're self-employed and you can technically wait until June 15th to get everything done by the end of April, pay your tax bill uh, and be done with that.
So that is pretty much all the information that I had to share with you. Uh, we're now going to move on to some questions. So I did ask people in advance of this webinar to submit their questions. And thank you very much to those of you who did submit a question. I picked a, a few of them that I thought would be uh, more, uh, un somewhat universal and probably would apply to a lot of people. So I'm just going to go through a few of those now. So question number one. I apply for a grant in April and in August I get awarded, which means I'll receive the funds in September. This grant, however, will cover my living expenses for February to June of the next fiscal year. Will I pay extra taxes this year or is there a way I can move this income to the next fiscal year for when it was actually planned for on my end? I love this question because it gives me an excuse to talk about cash-based accounting versus accrual-based accounting. So for most of you, in most cases, for your uh, self-employed business, you are going to want to use what's called the accrual method. When you use the accrual method, you report your income in the period in which you earn it, whether or not you have actually received it and you deduct the expenses in the period in which you incur them, whether or not you paid them. That is uh, versus cash-based accounting, where you would report your income when you received it, whether or not you provided the good or service, and you would deduct the expense when you paid it, whether or not you had any income related. So it's just, if, if you're just going by when the money goes in and out of your bank account, that would be cash-based. But uh, for most of you, you're gonna wanna use the accrual-based method. It's gonna be more advantageous and is the answer to this person's question about the grant money. So in this specific case, the grant money, even if it hits the bank account in 2020, it is what we would call unearned revenue because the activity related to that money is going to happen in 2021. So basically what you're doing there is you're deferring that income to the next year when then you're going to incur the expenses and you can report both of those things on your tax return. So that is accrual based accounting. Question number two, should I pay myself as a self-employed artist? How does that work? Well, the simple answer to that is yes, I hope that you are paying yourself. <laughs> um, I hope that you are able to pay yourself. I want you to be able to pay yourself. Uh, the trick here really is to understand that you are taxed on the entire net income of your business for the entire year. So all of the revenue that you have taken in minus all of your eligible expenses becomes that taxable income, whether or not you have paid it to yourself. So let's say, you know, you have a separate bank account for your business, whether or not you have transferred any funds into your personal account, that is the income that, that you are taxed on. And when you do pay yourself, that is not a business expense. If you are keeping track, you know, in your logbook of, of all your revenues and all your expenses, when you are transferring money to yourself, basically what you're doing um, in an accounting term is you're drawing money from your business, which is not the same as spending money related to earning income. Um, so again, hopefully you're in a position where you are able to take home some money uh, from your business. Uh, from your self-employment, um, but it's, it is important to remember that you're not including those amounts um, as business expenses, okay? All right, question number three. Is it advantageous to file jointly with your partner? 
So as you probably already know, um, your marital status is of course reported in the, the first section of your tax return. And the CRE does not require you to file jointly with your spouse. However, you are required to disclose information about them, um, including their net income for that tax year. So uh, while it's you don't have to file jointly, there can be advantages to doing your taxes together this way. Uh, specifically, when you're looking at your federal tax credits, there are amounts that can be transferred between spouses, and that includes things like uh, the climate action incentive, um, if one of you has uh, unused tuition amounts, uh, medical expenses, donations and gifts. So what you can do when you're preparing your returns is you can kind of take some of these amounts and shift them from one return to the other to see uh, how that changes and where the, 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 uh, the claim is most advantageous. Okay, this one's really cool. Question number four. Do I have to fill out the T2125 for a business if I made less than $10,000 of self-employment business income? I like the, the quotes in this one. Theater tech work and I'm not looking to expense slash deduct anything on that form. If I'm apparently a business, is there anything else I should be doing? Okay, so this is an excellent question because it goes back to that whole idea of when you are self-employed, you don't necessarily think of yourself as running a business. Um, perhaps it's simply that you are getting paid uh, with amounts that are not taxed at source. Maybe you don't have a workspace in your home. You don't advertise your services. You don't do any of the things that are immediately obvious uh, to most people that that signal you that you are running a business. However, the way that you report self-employment income on your tax return is as though you are a business. So there are advantages to thinking about it in this way. Do you have to claim any of the expenses on that T2125 form? No, you don't have to. But look at that list of expenses and just think, is there anything I could be claiming? So that goes back to, you know, when you say, is there anything I should be doing? Maybe think about some of the ways you can reduce your taxable income amount by claiming some of the expenses related to the work that you're doing. So for example, when you go to work, uh, do you have to eat while you're at work? Keep that receipt, that's a business expense. Did you have to travel to get to your work? How did you travel? That's a business expense. You can claim that on this form. So if you just start to think about it in this way, even though you don't have all of these expenses, you might have some of them and it could help you with that tax bill. Um, at the end of the year. Are there any other questions that have popped up that I could handle at this time? All right, cool. Well, what did we do? We went through in pretty good detail the T2125, which is the main thing you gotta wrap your brain around when you're doing um, taxes as a self-employed individual. We talked about the COVID uh, income support programs and how that is considered other income. And um, while I'm sure we're all grateful that those amounts existed in 2020 when a lot of other work went away, um, what might be unfortunate for you at, at this point is that now you have to pay the tax bill associated um, with that, that income. Um, and we talked about different types of uh, expenses that you can claim, including your business use of home, yeah, your motor vehicle. We dealt with uh, what is a capital cost versus an expense. Um, so to wrap up, I just have one more thing to help you 
cope with tax season. Uh, and these are just my, my little tips for you. So the first thing is consistency. The CRA really loves consistency. So once you are reporting something in, in one way, you want to report it the same way every year. When you prepare your tax return, compare it to last year's and the year before. It's good to look at those five-year comparatives and see that everything is landing in the same places. What can red flag your return is when there's uh, when things are moving to different lines all of a sudden in your return, or there's there's big uh, big differences, big jumps. So just think about consistency and make sure you're doing things the same way. And if you do learn something that changes how you're reporting something on your tax return, uh, certainly make the change, but then you're going to want to go back to your previous year returns and make that change and refile those previous returns. Okay, um, so that's consistency. Organization, which we've touched on throughout. Uh, decide. Decide what your system is going to be for keeping track of all your sources of income and all of your expenses, and then stick to that system. Are you going to do it uh, once a month, once a quarter, or even once a year? Whatever it is, um, be good to yourself. <laughs> and right now, you know, we are talking about the, the 2020 taxes, but now is a great time to set yourself up for success in 2021 if you didn't have that system in place for 2020. Decide what your record keeping is going to be. And if it's too much, if you don't have the time for it, find the tools or the services that are going to help you get that done because it's really going to help when it comes to tax time. Planning. So tax planning is obviously a, a, a big area. Um, there are some, you know, a couple small things that I would just mention specifically for uh, self-employed individuals, and that is to think about the fact every time you are earning self-employment income that isn't taxed at source, that you remember that, that that you know throughout the year that at the end of the year you may owe uh, taxes to the government. So maybe you, for example, uh, put a, a savings plan in place where every time you bring in revenue, you take, you know, that 10 or 15 percent and you set it aside to pay your tax bill. Um, another thing you can do, and it, frankly, another thing that you want to think about as a self-employed person is uh, retirement. So if you don't already have a, a, a registered savings plan, an RSP, think about setting one up. Um, you can make contributions to that throughout the year that are going to, again, reduce that tax bill um, at the end of the year. The basic uh, uh, calculation is for every $1,000 that you put into your RSP, it's going to reduce your tax bill by about $300. That's about the ratio that you can think about. Um, so that helps you in two ways. It can reduce your taxes and help you save for retirement. So just something to think about there. Um, and, you know, as your situation gets more complex, you may want to work with someone on tax planning. Uh, and, and, you know, a financial advisor can help you, an accountant can help you, uh, that kind of thing. And then the last thing is just education. So obviously, when you take the initiative to, you know, do webinars like this, that's fantastic. The more you understand your own tax situation, um, the better your outcomes are going to be. Even if you are paying someone to do your taxes, you have to communicate the relevant information to them. So it's good that you know uh, what your rights are when it comes to um, what you have to report and what you can claim. The CRA website has a ton of resources. You can look things up there. You can contact the CRA if there's anything that doesn't make sense to you or you want to ask a specific question about. So in general, just um, staying, staying educated and staying on top of your situation uh, is going to help uh, when you're preparing the tax return. So those are my tips. Uh, if we have no 
other questions. Um, I think I'm a few minutes over, so we should, I'll wrap this up here. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to Rebecca and Ludmilla from Tactics. Thank you so much for having me back this year to the Green Room series. Um, big thank you to Al Connors, who produced this whole thing and put me on the air today. Uh, if you do have any uh, questions that didn't get answered or if I can help you with your tax situation or your bookkeeping situation at all uh, my email is hm at lowertownbookkeeping.com feel free to reach out I'm happy to chat and uh, thank you again for for attending and uh, good luck with your taxes <laughs>